Hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Moritz Weiss. Um, I'm a PhD student. I started this year, uh, February, so eight months in almost. Um, my PhD thesis is um, sponsored by Diondo, as you might see. <laughs> and yeah, that's my background. Uh, my topic is data driven material decomposition in industrial CT, which can be used as the image in inside the image based pipeline at the characterization step where you want to, to characterize and measure your um, your sample and then do, then do further processing with it. Is it working like that? Yeah, it is. Uh, okay, just a fast overview. Um, from my perspective, a CT scan, you have a CT scanner for sure. You put in your, you plug in your uh, sample, collect projections, do the reconstruction and get out the tomogram. Um, in each voxel contains the information of this linear absorption coefficient, which you already know from the keynote. Um, it consists of this uh, density there and some mass attenuation. So in case you have one material inside your workpiece and you know this material, you directly know this mu m and you measure this mu l, so you directly get uh, the density. So in case of one material, it's pretty easy to get the density inside your measured sample. Um, this plot, ah, oh, there it is. Um, you've already seen some kind of this plot. This is for iron here, the attenuation. Um, most interesting part is this yellow area here. This is where a typical 450 kilovolt tube from, from our industrial use case is operating and the, the peak photons, like uh, the, the most signal dominating photons are there. So we're in this, in this area. The K edge of iron is down there. And for other materials, there is a more colorful overview. Um, there is magnesium, aluminum, iron in, in the solid lines. You see the K edge is uh, I think there and over there. So our normal spectra operate in this shadowed or in this shadowed area, and we do not have any K edge information in our signal. So we cannot use these K edges there as, as some kind of characteristic fingerprints for the materials as used, for example, in, uh, in clinical K edge absorption. We, we saw sort of, uh, together um, last, in the last days some example of this K edge absorption reconstruction things, but this is not possible for our use case. The problem is, we will see later again, when you have more than one material, probably two or three materials, and you're in, in this or in this range, there can be inside one voxel different fractions of the materials and they yield the same absorption coefficient. So you don't know the exact composition inside this voxel. And this leads to a highly ill post problem when you want to decompose the fractions of the materials inside a voxel. So what is our approach? We try to do it very simple. We have some input data. We have a low energy tomogram here at 80 kVp, a high energy tomogram, and we want to get the material maps. So maybe just for an example, there's, there are triangle areas. This area completely consists of, um, I think it's aluminum, yeah. And over here you see there is no magnesium inside. So we want to get from the tomograms directly the material mappings and how to do this. Um, there is a giant box, let's call it the black box. We don't know, we can try to figure out how to calculate this, the physics are are known mostly, and as you know, my background is from physics, so I, I want to know the analytical function which maps from the input to the output, but then sometimes it's not, not useful and it's not economic, economical to do this, so we have to do something else, and this is maybe a nice case for machine or deep learning in this case. Just one sentence, probably you all know it. Um, the main approach is we plug in some inputs, or we provide some inputs, these inputs are processed in some fashion we don't know, it's, it's hidden, and we get the desired output. But in real life, it's a bit more complicated than this. Six nodes there, 
we have a model looking like this. Um, this is probably a bit too much, but I will jump very fast through it. At the beginning here, here's the, here's the starting point. We have, we have two channels, which are the low and the high energy tomograms and the spatial dimensions of the tomogram. And we sandwich them together and do some convolution with the three times three kernel normalization, activation function, just some, some, some normal machine deep learning stuff. And we are processing over here where the spatial dimension of the, the tomograms is, is still the same, but we have now 32 feature channels. Then we do, and it's called an encoder step. We do a maxpool operation, which halves the spatial dimension. So when you're first provided tomograms with, let's say, 100 pixels in each, each direction, at this point, we're going down to 50 in each direction, but we have more features. Right now, we have 32 features. We're doing this again. We're over here. We're doing this again here. So the, the spatial dimension is now just at a quarter. And the features, the feature channel count is 128. The original unit, you, you might know it. Uh, I think it goes up to 1,000 channels, but for this use case, it's not useful. It's, it's enough to use this, this shallow unit architecture. And on the other side, we're down here. Now we're using the decoding path. We're going up. So from this 128 features, we are doing an interpolate, which doubles the spatial dimension again up to here. We sandwich these two together, doing the convolution, doing this again. And as you can see over here, we are at a point where the spatial dimension is the same like in the beginning there, and we still have two channels. And this is looking pretty like we have here the two dual energy tomograms. And over here, we have the two different material maps, or in this case, two different materials plus air. Um, you all know for deep learning and almost every machine learning thing, we need a very large pool of data. So there are two possibilities to collect this data. We can try to do CT scans. We need a lot of time for that. We need some, some samples for that. We have to design the samples maybe with some kind of linear gradient of material composition or something else. We have to manufacture them. We have to make sure that these manufactured parts are really looking like in the design. And uh, as we've already seen, this is not always the part. Uh, and um, another possibility would be just to use a simulation. We can, can say, okay, this is a virtual part. We design it perfectly and we do some ray tracing and simulation stuff, reconstruction and get the tomograms. And there won't be any manufacturing problem. The only thing we have to, to mention there is the sim to real gap. When you do simulations, the simulation will never be perfect. So when you, you train a model with artificial data from simulation, you will never get the perfect results on real data. When you, the model has only seen virtual data, um, the, the real data from real CT scanners with scattering and other things, dead pixels, whatever, We'll have some problems, but there are mechanisms to do this. Maybe I'll do this in the next month. Let's see. So we're using the simulation approach. Um, how is this done? I said we're just sampling a phantom like this. We're saying, okay, this voxel consists of some, some material A and this of some material B. Mixtures are also allowed. And we have directly material maps. Then we do some, uh, yeah regular simulation, we measure intersection lengths, calculating the photon count for the two energy spectra we're using. Typically, I think it's 100 kVp on the lower side and 350 on the high energy side. Do the reconstruction and we have the low and the high energy tomogram. So we can build some, some kind of tuple with input and output data. And this will be our train tuples for training. Let's have a very quick look at the results. Um, on the very left, we have the, the low and the high energy tomograms looking like this. Here are the ground truth of material A, in this case, magnesium, and down here, aluminum. And on the third column, there is the prediction by the model. On the right side, on the very right side, we have the difference we see in the, in the main areas, in the large areas. There's also, there's almost no, no error, because it's very, very small. Problems occur at edges, 
and at corners where a lot of these triangles meet, but this should be some kind of problem with resolution and the model has, has some problems. Um, note also, this is magnified by 10. So um, yeah, we see anything. So the prediction seems to look pretty good. This is a more quantitative overview. Um, we can see, okay, for magnesium, it's on the left. We see when we, we're looking at a ground truth value of, let's say, 0 0.6, we're getting very, very good predictions of 0 0.6. So the model has very, uh, very, very low uh, standard deviation and it's also almost zero standard. So it's very good prediction. It's working pretty well in this case for magnesium and aluminium. We can do this also with some more industry relevant material, let's say, uh, for example, uh, Titan 64 and some aluminum alloy. And it's looking pretty similar. We're still getting good results. So with this approach, we can discriminate material systems with two materials plus air and do this on regular two energy channels. Okay, in summary, um, we did a simulation. Um, the phantom sampling intersection length measurement, photon pattern construction, nothing too special. And the subsequent machine learning used the unit architecture, which is, I think, somewhere down here. Yeah, this is the original unit used for image segmentation. But we can use it also for this kind of regression task, looking closer the mapping of the tomograms to the material maps seems to be a pixel to pixel translation problem. Um, you can use simple, way more simple regression model where you plug in just two float values and get out two float values. But the problem is when you have some, when you have multiple measurements, you can collect this dual energy images in real life with two subsequent measurements. You can do stuff like dual source measurements, sandwich detector, photon counters, there are a lot of possibilities. You will never have the perfect match um, voxel on voxel or pixel on pixel. So this this approach with the with the UNet is using a concept which is called receptive field, which is also known from from the from the human eye. So it uses some spatial context information. It's that makes it not not bad if the the images are not perfectly um, registered. If there is little shift, it's no problem. The, the network will just look in a region and extract the information necessary. Yeah, uh, we tried this for several combinations like magnesium, aluminum, iron, and very, uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of stuff. It works pretty well. It's not working when you have very, very, very small fractions of elements inside alloys. When you want to discriminate between two alloys that are quite similar and one has like, uh, say, 5% aluminum and the other has 6.5, you will see a very, very small difference, but the model has some problems with that. Maybe it's resolution bound, we'll check this in the future. Um, but that would be a nice application to get some quality assurance on the lowest manufacturer. Yeah, and that's pretty much what we did. Down there you see the references. Um, <laughs> thanks.